On the 6th of June 1944, the invasion of Normandy, codenamed Operation Overlord, began, as British, American, Canadian and French forces conducted airborne and seaborne landings along a 95km front to begin the liberation of German-occupied France. The seaborne element was launched against five beaches, where the British, Canadians and French landed on beaches codenamed Gold, Juno and Sword in the east, whilst the Americans landed on Utah and Omaha in the west. Situated between Utah and Omaha at a clifftop position known as Point de Hoc was a German gun battery which Allied intelligence identified as containing six 155mm guns capable of hitting both Utah and Omaha beaches and as such was considered a significant threat to the success of the American seaborne landings so much so that the Supreme Allied Commander US General Dwight Eisenhower designated it target number one in the entire invasion sector. Although the naval and air planners for Operation Overlord were confident that their forces alone could neutralise the battery, US First Army Commander General Omar Bradley, who was responsible for the American landings, wanted to be certain it was taken out, and subsequently in January of 1944, he assigned Lieutenant Colonel James Rudder, the commanding officer of the US 2nd Ranger Battalion, the mission of securing it. Over the next few months, Rudder and his staff drew up a plan for how they were going to assault Point de Hoc with the final draft calling for 225 rangers from the 2nd Ranger Battalion to be inserted by landing craft onto the beach, then climb up the 30 metre high cliff and assault the German position. Once they had taken out the six guns, the rangers were then to set up a defensive perimeter around Point de Hoc and wait to be relieved by US troops arriving from Omaha Beach. Assisting with their preparations was Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Trevor, a British commando who joined the 2nd Rangers in early 1944 and would be accompanying them to Point de Hoc as an advisor. In his advisory role, Lieutenant Colonel Trevor proved to be influential in shaping the final assault plan as set out by Lieutenant Colonel Rudder, who, knowing Trevor's expertise in cliff climbing, handed him the responsibility for readying the Rangers for their 30 metre climb up the cliff face. Alongside Trevor, the Rangers were also joined by Lieutenant Ronald Eads of the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve and who would also be joining them in their assault on Point de Hoc. Lieutenant Eads was part of a small team from the British Combined Operations Headquarters which had overall command of the British Commandos and their support assets that was designing and providing specialised equipment to aid the Rangers in their climb up the cliff. One piece of equipment included the use of rocket propelled grapnel ropes attached to the sides of each landing craft whilst another, dubbed the Swan, involved attaching a 30 meter extendable ladder outfitted with two Vickers machine guns onto the rear of a DUKW amphibious truck. The idea here was once on the beach for the Swans to drive up to the base of the cliff and extend their ladders to the top of Point de Hoc, enabling the Rangers to climb up with relative ease and commence their assault on the German position. In total, four Swans were to be acquired for the mission with the Royal Army Service Corps of the British Army providing six men to crew three of them. By the 1st of June 1944, the Rangers had completed their preparations and alongside hundreds of thousands of Allied troops began to make their way onto their troop ships on the British South Coast, where they joined the thousands of other naval vessels amassed for the invasion. Four days later on the 5th, after a 24-hour postponement, General Dwight Eisenhower gave the go-ahead for Operation Overlord the long-awaited liberation of Western Europe had finally begun. In the early morning hours of the 6th of June 1944, the invasion armada arrived off the coast of Normandy, from where the men of the US 2nd Ranger Battalion, under the cover of an intense naval and air bombardment, loaded up onto their landing craft to begin the voyage to Point de Hoc. The approach to the coastline didn't go without incident, however, as the poor weather conditions combined with German gunfire took its toll on the Ranger Flotilla, who not only suffered from a navigational error but also lost both their supply boats, one of the Swans, and one of the assault landing craft carrying 20 Rangers. Writing after the invasion, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Trevor noted, I considered that this alone was enough to render the operation against Point de Hoc abortive, 
However, so great was the tactical surprise and such the verve and dash of the Rangers that it made no difference. At approximately 0710, some 40 minutes behind schedule, the remaining nine landing craft and three British crewed swans arrived at the beach, with Lieutenant Colonel James Rudder's boat touching down first. To Rudder's left, landing craft 722, carrying both Lieutenant Colonel Trevor and Lieutenant Ronald Eads, in addition to 20 Rangers, fired off its rocket propelled ropes, hit the beach, and dropped its ramp, enabling the troops on board to exit the craft and rush forward to the bottom of the cliff. On Exit 722, Trevor, armed with a Sten gun, walked up and down the beach to encourage and boost the morale of the US Rangers, when suddenly a stray bullet hit his US M1 helmet and knocked him off his feet into a nearby crater. Without hesitation, several Rangers rushed to his assistance, pulling him out from the crater and into cover, where they checked him over for any injuries. Remarkably, the helmet had borne the brunt of the impact, and the Lieutenant Colonel suffered only a minor wound to his forehead, which was bandaged up by a nearby medic. Landing behind the Rangers, the three British crewed swans made their run into the beach, but found that their mobility was severely limited thanks to the number of craters that littered the area, and as such were unable to provide any kind of assistance to the Rangers. Nonetheless, the US troops were able to use some of the ropes far from the landing craft to climb up the cliff face, with small scattered groups reaching the top within five minutes of landing and moving off to their objectives. No sooner had the rangers began fighting their way inland did they discover that the six 155mm guns were nowhere to be seen, and instead in their gun pits telephone poles with camouflage netting sat in their place. Undiscouraged and determined to complete their mission, the rangers fought to their next objective, the Grand Camp Verville Road, which they reached at approximately 0800, and where they began establishing an outer defensive perimeter around Point de Hoc, whilst also sending out several patrols two of which by chance stumbled across the guns hidden down the lane, which they destroyed through the use of thermite grenades. Meanwhile, back at the point itself, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Trevor and Lieutenant Ronald Eads had made their way up the cliff and linked up with Lieutenant Colonel James Rudder in his command post, which he had established in a crater adjacent to one of the German bunkers. This is a photo of Rudder's CP and, visible in the bottom right, is Lieutenant Colonel Trevor, wearing the British Combined Operations patch and with his forehead bandaged up following the incident on the beach. Unfortunately, this is the only known photograph showing British troops at Point de Hoc, but it provides us with a small insight into their experience in the battle. When he arrived at the command post, Lieutenant Colonel Trevor realised it was far too crowded for Rudder to have effective command and control over the situation, with both the wounded and Rudder's headquarters staff all crammed together in the crater. Subsequently, after investigating the inside of the German bunker, Trevor suggested it be used for the wounded, and after being cleared out, it became the medical aid post for the second rangers. Meanwhile, back down on the beach, the six British soldiers of the Royal Army Service Corps, who'd been assigned to the Swans, began to offer their hand to the rangers, repairing a dozen or so rifles and machine guns, and collecting whatever pieces of equipment and ammunition they could find that had been left in the landing craft, which they distributed amongst the US troops. At the same time, they gathered their own rifles and took up positions as riflemen within the Ranger perimeter, in anticipation for the arrival of the relief force from Omaha Beach that was expected at around midday. However, besides a small detachment of Rangers from the US 5th Ranger Battalion who arrived from Omaha late on the 6th of June, the main relief force never arrived, and instead the Rangers found themselves over the next 48 hours, holding off numerous German counter-attacks which aimed to drive them off the point and into the sea. The peak of these attacks came on the night of the 6th and morning of the 7th of June, when the Rangers were pushed back from the Verville Road to a small fragile perimeter on Point de Hoc itself, leaving Rudder with a force of only 90 men capable of taking up arms. Realising the worsening situation facing the Rangers, particularly with regards to ammunition, Private Colin Blackmore and Corporal Joseph Good, both of the Royal Army Service Corps, paired up and made several trips back to the beach to salvage more equipment and ammunition including the recovery of several Vickers machine guns, which they hauled up the cliff and brought into action. It was whilst returning from one of these trips that Private Blackmore was wounded in the foot by a ricochet, and after being patched up by a US medic, he returned to the front line, and at one stage even went out into the open under German machine gun and mortar fire, to drag to safety a ranger who was lying wounded in the open. Elsewhere, Lieutenant Ronald Eads had also grabbed his rifle and joined the rangers on the front line, 
from where he spotted and engaged a German sniper that was causing the Rangers some trouble. However, when he began to relocate from one position to another, he was mistakenly fired on by a couple of Rangers who believed him to be a German soldier. Luckily, all the shots missed and Lieutenant Eads rushed to the relative safety of Rudder's command post, where he linked back up with Lieutenant Colonel Trevor, who, with every passing second, was growing increasingly anxious with the situation, and when personally asked about it by Lieutenant Colonel Rudder, Trevor replied with, Never have I been so convinced of anything in my life as that I'll either be a prisoner of war or a casualty by morning. Fortunately, accurate support and fire from the offshore Allied warships kept the German advances at bay throughout the 7th of June, enabling much needed supplies to be delivered to the Rangers and the evacuation of the wounded to take place, including that of Private Colin Blackmore, who was withdrawn to the battleship USS Texas, to have his foot wound properly seen to. Then, on the morning of the 8th of June 1944, US infantry, reinforced with Sherman tanks and with naval fire support, arrived from Omaha Beach, pushing back the German forces in the Point de Hoc area and making contact with what remained of the US Rangers, thus bringing an end to two days of heavy fighting. The link-up also marked the end of the British mission to Point de Hoc, and as soon as the eight men detached from the 2nd Rangers on the 9th of June 1944, their story faded into history, remembered by the few and forgotten by the many.